How does a sociologist look at the world? An historian, a literary scholar, a geographer. What are the distinct and specific ways that they look not just at the content, not just for the papers that they write and the books that they write, but how do these different disciplines look at the whole world? How would they look at the room that we're in right now in ways that might be different than you and I? We often think that in college, general education courses will provide this foundation, this varied way of looking at the world, that each student will graduate from college with distinct senses of how different disciplines look at the world. However, that doesn't often happen. To most undergraduate students, their general education classes look very much the same. They are in a, a room not unlike this, a large lecture room. The professor is talking, they're taking notes. Maybe if they're lucky, they're in a small group or two, they take tests. There's no way for them to know why a particular instructor felt so passionately about history or about geography to devote her whole life to studying it. Now, many people believe that this coverage model in which we load many, many facts, many basic facts into students is important. After all, without this foundational knowledge, how are students supposed to advance to the higher levels and do more interesting, creative, fun problems? I have a very unorthodox view of coverage, and it's because for the first five years of my own education, I went to a free school. So from what would have been kindergarten to fifth grade, I went to a school that would make the Montessori school look like the Marines. There were no grades, there were no lectures, there were no tests, there were no lessons. Basically, I played for five years and danced to early Beatles music. I didn't decide to learn how to read until I was eight years old. My parents took me to see Allie McGraw in Love Story. And I was swept away by her tragic and untimely death. So I decided I wanted to read the book. I went to one of the teachers. I asked her, teach me how to read. I'd like to do that now. She gave me some Dr. Seuss books. I plowed through them. And then the fourth book I ever read was Love Story. But that was not enough. I wanted to die tragically myself. So I organized the whole school into putting on a production of Louisa May Alcott's Little Women. How many of you have read Little Women? Everybody wants to be Joe, right? Not me. I wanted to be Beth, the perfect angelic sister who does, does no wrong and who dies tragically amidst great, great weeping. After that, I started to write my own books with uh, stapled pieces of construction paper. When I was mainstreamed into a traditional public school, I was terrified. Imagine my horror when I realized that for five years, these other kids, instead of playing, had been sitting in desks, learning lessons, taking tests, uh, learning how to do multiplication tables, uh, learning mysterious things like bell work and how to head a paper. It took me, however, only one month to catch up to all of the students who had been there for five years, and I was not a precocious child. This experience did not make me a radical educator. In some ways, I teach in a traditional way. I do give grades. I do assess. However, the experience that I had in the very beginning of my education radicalized my ideas about education. I don't believe that we have to do things a certain way because we've always done them that way. And I believe that nothing trumps a motivated and engaged student. Now that I teach literature in college, of course, I would love for every student to graduate college having read all of Shakespeare, all of the poetry of John Donne, all of the novels of Charles Dickens, and every word James Baldwin ever wrote. But that's not possible. And it's certainly not possible for the students who only take one general education intro to literature course. 
So instead of worrying about what to cover, I want to teach them the moves of the discipline, or at least one very important and key way of looking at the world and looking at a literary text, and that is to value and recognize complexity and ambiguity in literature. For example, I often teach Theodore Rotke's famous poem, My Papa's Waltz, which begins, the whiskey on your breath could make a small boy dizzy, but I hung on like death, such waltzing was not easy. When I teach that poem, I would say a good half of the class looks at the evidence in the poem, at the vocabulary and the tone, and they believe that it is a poem about a mean, abusive, drunken father who comes home and beats his child. And there's evidence to support that. There's another group of students who read the poem and they think it's a loving tribute to a hardworking, blue-collar father who, although rough around the edges, was in fact very loving. My job is to lead them through exercises so that they can see that both of those interpretations coexist. So they understand that they don't have to ignore one set of evidence just to uphold their initial thought. So they realize that the poem can contain both. With that skill, they can go off and read other poems, other novels, other essays, and they have a better way of engaging in them. And I think perhaps a more sophisticated understanding of human relationships as well.